Thank you, Christy, very appropriate. <laughs> uh, good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to worship this morning, whether you are here in the sanctuary with us, viewing the service on YouTube, Facebook, or the church website. I'll just draw your attention to a few announcements. Um, now, for those who are fully vaccinated, you are not required to wear a mask, but you are welcome to do so if you're more comfortable. And for those who have not been vaccinated, you need to wear the masks until seated and when singing. The uh, next blood drive in our fellowship hall will be Tuesday, June the 8th, from 1 to 6 in the fellowship hall. And baccalaureate Sunday will be June the 20th, which is also Father's Day. So for uh, anyone who has a child, grandchild that graduated either last year or this year because we weren't able to do it last year, please send the information to the church um, email or you can contact me and we will be recognizing those uh, graduates on the 20th. I'm going to light the candle of remembrance and the candle of peace. The candle of remembrance is lit for those in the military and their families, veterans, first responders, and all those in harm's way. And in particular today, we, we remember uh, all of our veterans as this Memorial Day weekend. And the candle of peace reminds us to pray for God's peace in our homes, community, nation, and the world. And we all know that the world is in great need of peace. Please join me in our call to worship. Stand as you are able. Oh. <laughs> Said I was going to light them. I guess I expected God to do it for me. <laughs> the fire is in our hearts, but let's stop and think about it just for a moment. <laughs> that wasn't intentional, by the way. <laughs> I could have said it right. Friends of God, believe this. God loved the world. God loves the world. We are the beloved. May the truth of this great love story shine through our worship today. And renew our sense of calling. So come with your tiredness, your frustrations, and your discouragements. Come with your doubts, your fears, and your longings. Come in friendship to God and to each other, and friendship to the world. To listen for God's word to us, to offer our prayers, and to renew our calling. To listen, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Friends of God, let us worship. Our first term this morning is number 188, Christ is the world's light.
may be seated. Please join me in our prayer of confession. God, we confess that we are impatient and selfish people. When you offer us the promise of a new future, we complain that you don't get there fast enough. When you provide for our need, we complain that it isn't enough. And when our bad attitudes and negative thoughts cause us to stumble, we blame you. Holy God, forgive our sinful ways, teach us to be patient, instruct us to be grateful, guide us to be responsible and humble as we turn ourselves around and look to the cross. Let us experience your grace and your gift of new life. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Now hear our assurance of pardon. How much does God love us? Enough to send the divine heart, hope, and spirit to us, not to condemn us, but to save us. We pass the peace this morning. Uh, we do it in, in a way that is respectful of uh, distancing still. Uh, we want to be careful. So as you are comfortable, you may greet each other. Thank you. be seated. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. 
If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is number 605, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters. seated. I don't know if many of you uh, know a lot of Bible verses by heart. Uh, that's something my little country church focused on when I was growing up in, in Westernville. We used to get prizes if we could memorize Bible verses, nickels, I think, and I was all about that. A nickel at a time, I would do that. Uh, <laughs> but even if you don't know many Bible verses by heart, John 3.16 is probably one that you do know. If you know one, that might be one that you know. And you might even know it the way that you learned it as a, a child in the King James Version. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But Bible verses that are not in their context are not always very helpful to us. In fact, sometimes they can be misleading when we take just a single verse. I remember, for example, a, a church website years ago that went viral because they accidentally quoted in a positive way as their website slogan, the words of the devil. <laughs> The words that the devil was saying to Jesus while tempting him in the wilderness. 
Apparently, the church website creator thought that the words sounded inspiring. (laughs) But in context, of course, we know that they were meant to lead Jesus away from his mission and purpose. Context matters for meaning making. And so even though we know John 3, 16, <laughs> I think we're good, we're, we're good, we're good. Even though we know John 3, 16 so well, I don't think we always are as great at remembering what's happening around that verse. What else is going on? What happens before and after these famous words are said? And so today we're listening in on that story. It's an encounter between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was an interpreter and a scholar of the law of Moses. And he wasn't just any Pharisee. He was also a leader among the Pharisees. He was a member of something called the Sanhedrin, which was was kind of like a supreme court, a group of of high-ranking judges. So Nicodemus is a person of some stature in the community. And John's Gospel tells us that Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. It seems that Nicodemus doesn't want anyone to know what he's doing. See, Jesus and the Pharisees are often at odds with each other in the scriptures. They're at odds over how to interpret and how to implement the words of the law of Moses. And increasingly, the Pharisees view Jesus as a threat. Nicodemus wants to talk to Jesus himself, but he's not exactly ready to be open about it, not ready to confront Jesus or his own questions where there could be witnesses. So Nicodemus says to Jesus, listen, we we know that you are a teacher who has come from God because nobody can do the, the signs that you've been doing apart from the presence of God. That's a significant admission for him to make. He and his colleagues know who Jesus is, he says. They believe that he's from God. They've seen evidence in the signs that Jesus has done that convinced them that Jesus is from God. Nicodemus doesn't actually get to the point of asking any questions of Jesus. Jesus just goes ahead and responds as if Nicodemus has already asked something. Jesus says, No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus and the other leaders might recognize that Jesus is from God, has God's presence with him, but that's not the same as embracing and experiencing Jesus and his message, embracing the kingdom of God, embracing God's reign and God's vision for earth coming to fruition, which is the focus of Jesus' ministry. But Nicodemus doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. He, he takes Jesus' words very literally. He says, how can somebody be born after growing old? Can somebody enter their mother's womb again to be born anew? So Jesus elaborates. He says, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and the spirit. Don't be astonished that I'm saying you have to be born from above. The spirit is like the wind. You don't know where the wind comes from or where it goes, but you hear it and you feel it moving. And the spirit works in just the same way. And that's what it means to be born from above, born of water and spirit. And still, Nicodemus does not understand. And he wonders, how can these things be? And in turn, Jesus says that somebody who is meant to be a teacher and interpreter of the law can't understand what he's saying. And so Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that whoever believes in him may not perish, but 
may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So this is a weird mention, this uh, Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. And his words are very strange if you don't know the context. And it's tempting to sort of skip right over them because they don't make sense to us. But Jesus is talking about a story that we can read in Numbers, in the book of Numbers in the Bible, in chapter 21. It's this story of the bronze serpent. The Israelites had been wandering in the desert on this 40-year journey to the promised land, and they were complaining again to God about uh, and to Moses about food and water. And this is something that just happened repeatedly on their journey from enslavement to freedom. And these passages in the Bible, they're known as the murmurings, although I think maybe mutterings might be a more apt description. They're on their way to the promised land. They're on their way from a terrible life of enslavement and oppression. And God has been delivering on every promise God has made to them. And yet for some reason, and, and perhaps it's because they've experienced such trauma, or perhaps it's like they're, they're testing their limits to see if God will still really love them even when they've been bad. Whenever things get difficult, the Israelites complain. They mutter and they murmur about their plight. And this time, when they start complaining, poisonous snakes come among them. The snakes would bite people and they would die. And the people interpret these snakes to be a punishment on them from God because apparently they, they have a sense they have a sense or a fear that they have been pushing God too far. So finally, they come to Moses and they confess their sinfulness and they ask Moses for help. And Moses prays for the people and he hears God, God's voice telling him to create a serpent out of bronze that would be fixed to a pole and set among the people. And the passage concludes, whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would come and stand in front of the serpent of bronze and look at it, and then they would live. This is a really bizarre story, isn't it, right? Making a bronze serpent seems like a really strange solution for a people that had a lot of uh, kind of thoughts about making these images and, and idols and stuff. It's, it seems like a really strange cure for these snake bites. But this sequence of events makes the people look their fear and sin and mutterings symbolized in this serpent, makes them look that right in the face. The snake has become a symbol of their turning away from God, and they have to look that right in the face in order to experience healing. They have to confront that reality directly. The Israelites need to believe and trust in their relationship with God and God's promises to them. And as they look their sin in the face, they experience reconciliation and life. And that all brings us back to Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In, in the Greek, in the language of the New Testament, the word lifted up is actually the same word as the word crucified, so, just as the Israelites looked their sin in the face in order to live, so too we look at Jesus face to face, raised up in his offering, his life for ours, for ours so that, that we too can look our sin in the face, that we look our turning away from God in the face 
and we might live. And that's what Jesus wants for us, that we might live, that we might have eternal life, that we might live completely in God's kingdom, God's reign on earth and in eternity, that we might experience God's vision for us in all its fullness, that we might be born anew in the full potential that God wants for us and for our world. Nicodemus knows that Jesus is a teacher and knows that Jesus is from God and that God's presence is in Jesus. But does he get the heart of what Jesus is trying to tell him? His behavior, his approaching Jesus at night where he couldn't be seen by others, along with his questions, which don't seem to dig very deep, suggests that Nicodemus isn't ready for this direct face-to-face -face encounter with who Jesus really is or what it means for Nicodemus and Nicodemus's relationship with God. This past week, I had the opportunity to give my, my first academic paper presentation at a conference uh, as part of my, my doctoral work. I'm focusing in my PhD work on animal studies and food ethics, and this conference was called Witnessing and Worlding Beyond the Human. And in the panel I was a part of, I was talking about Holy Communion, but almost everybody else was talking about uh, animals, and one of the other speakers was talking about how we can study human behavior, we can learn more about human behavior when we study animal behavior, because uh, humans use language in ways that contradict our behaviors, which makes communication challenging. In other words, in humans, there is a big gap between what we say and what we do. Uh, there's a gap between our actions and the claims that we make with our words. We can deceive others, and we can deceive ourselves with our words, something that other animals don't seem to do, at least not in the same ways that humans do. And so we can mask the meaning of our behavior with language, and we can communicate a different message in words than the message that our behaviors communicates on their own. I think that's what we are encountering in this scene with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a scholar, and he's a leader in his faith, someone people probably respected and held in high regard. And all of these details about him communicate that he is someone with understanding and someone who has a deep faith and who has a strong relationship with God, but his behavior doesn't match up. His behavior is deceiving both himself and those who expect certain things from members of the Sanhedrin. But Nicodemus can't deceive Jesus. Jesus knows that he isn't getting it. And so Jesus invites Nicodemus, like the Israelites had to confront that bronze serpent, Jesus invites Nicodemus to confront what he doesn't know, to confront the real depth of his relationship with God, to confront what he knows and what he doesn't, and to make a fresh start from there. Nicodemus has all of these credentials, but it's the disciples of Jesus, people who don't have any social standing or even have a negative social standing, those without status in the religious circles of the day, the disciples are the ones who had already come face to face with Jesus and put it all on the line to follow him. All those disciples didn't know the kinds of things, the, the facts and interpretations that Nicodemus did, but they knew Jesus and they left everything to follow him. After this story in the scripture, Nicodemus sort of fades out. There's no real 
end to this conversation with Jesus. We don't know how Nicodemus responds, at least immediately, to everything that Jesus has said to him. It seems like Jesus' words kind of overwhelm him, and we get no response But what we do see in the Gospels is that Nicodemus appears again later. First, when the Pharisees are urging action to be taken against Jesus, Nicodemus reminds them that the law does not condemn people without giving them a trial first. And then, after Jesus' crucifixion, Nicodemus helps Joseph of Arimathea with Jesus's burial. So we know that Nicodemus doesn't immediately drop his nets, so to speak, to follow Jesus, but it seems like something is sinking in by degrees. And I think eventually Nicodemus stopped hiding and started encountering Jesus face to face. What about us? What conversations do we bring to Jesus by night? What are the things that we're we're trying to hide from others and hide from God and hide from ourselves? What are the things in us that we are not ready to confront? I can't help but think of that advice that, that Mr. Rogers shared, you know, that anything that's human is mentionable and anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. Our, our struggles, our sins, all those mutterings and murmurings, the things that we want to hide, the questions that we only want to voice in the dark, Jesus wants to draw all of that out from us. And Jesus wants to draw us out so that we can truly know him and be known by him. God so loves us that Jesus seeks to draw us out of hiding, that we might confront ourselves, come face to face with Christ, and become new creations, transformed by God's love. Amen. For those of us in the sanctuary, um, you may leave your offerings in the basket in the narthex. And for those at home, You may mail your offerings to the church at 823 Franklin Park Drive. join me in our prayer of dedication. God of grace, you love us so much that you give us precious gifts. We tend to give gifts cautiously, to give gifts of minimal value, to give gifts from what remains after lavishing gifts on ourselves. You gave our child so that in believing we would have eternal life. Our gifts today seem so small, but you can multiply them through hearts that we have warmed and softened. And with them, you can change the world. Change us, the givers, in the process. In Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Friends, as we come together in a time of prayer, are there some joys and concerns uh, that you'd like to share today? Anyone have a, a prayer request this morning? Dale. Yay. That's awesome. I, you know, I saw pictures on Facebook, and you understand, when I'm, I've been a pastor someplace, and then I leave, I, the kids are, like, just frozen in time at whatever age they were when I was here, and I'm like, um, Cole, a master's degree? What? That can't be right, but apparently, apparently he's continued to age. <laughs> Congratulations to him. That's exciting. Chuck. Thanks, Chuck. We'll, we'll continue to keep Marcia in our prayers. Others? Friends, let's join our hearts together in a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks that we are able to uh, be together, whether we are in this space, this physical space, or whether we are together in spirit as we join in worship over uh, Facebook and YouTube and, and websites. We're thankful for the, the mediums that allow us to continue to be the body of Christ. And we are reminded, God, that there is nothing that will stop us from praising you, from worshiping, from being your disciples. Help us, God, to continue to live out our, our mission and purpose in all of the ways that you enable us to do so. Oh God, as we gather today, we are mindful of this Memorial Day weekend, and we give thanks for uh, those who have served and who have given of themselves, uh, given the, the ultimate gift, the gift of their own life in service to nation. We especially pray, God, for those who have fresh grief and loss that they are wrestling with on this day. And on this day when people are traveling from place to place, we ask God for your protection and, and safety to be with them. We thank God of all that is happening in our communities and across our nation and particularly around the world as we wrestle with violence, as we continue to see uh, the pandemic um, impacting uh, places, even as we feel things opening up and, and things uh, changing here, we're mindful of nations where that is not yet the case. We're mindful of the of the needs that people have, the, the struggles and the difficulties that are all around us. And we pray, God, for your peace and for your strength in us that we might be messengers of your peace. Oh God, we lift before you the, the joys and the concerns that are, are close and dear to our hearts. We lift up to you, Marcia, as she has spent some time in the hospital again this week and uh, is looking for healing and strength and recovery. Oh God, bring that to her and let her especially feel the abiding presence of your spirit, encouraging her as she perseveres through challenge after challenge. God, we give you thanks for the blessings that you, you bestow on us and the celebrations that you make such a joyful part of our life. And so we give thanks for Cole and his graduation uh, with his master's degree and, and the, uh, the position that he secured and, and just all the possibilities that are before him, the path that you are uh, opening up for him, God. We give you thanks and we ask you to continue to pour out your blessings on him. We pray, God, for 
all of the uh, young people uh, who are going through these momentous uh, occasions of life in this strange time in our world. You have uh, been with them, and they have shown such perseverance. Oh God, continue to uh, help them and encourage them in these times of transition. Oh God, we seek to be your disciples, but sometimes we are like Nicodemus, trying to wait until dark, not really ready to look at the struggles, look at our questions, look at the ways that we have wandered away from you face to face just yet. Help us to remember that it is because of your great love that you sent Jesus, that we might look at him face to face, remembering that Jesus knows us so well already. Help us to learn who Jesus is, to learn who you are, God, not just in facts, but in experiences of life transformation, experiences of the power of your redeeming love, remembering that you come not to condemn, but to save us. Together, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 369, Blessed Assurance.
the good news. For God so loves you, so loves you, that God gave his only son so that you who believe in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn you, but in order that you might be saved through him. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen.